Well, thank you so much for coming. My name is Sam Haynes. I'm the director of the Center for Southwest Studies here. And our next speaker, Dominic Bracco, is a UTA alumnus. And he's also spoken here before. About five years ago, the center and other um, on-campus entities put on a month-long program on Mexico's uh, drug-related violence. We called it the War Next Door. And um, at the time, Dominic had only been out of UTA maybe three or four years. And he spoke to a packed room on the sixth floor of the library. Uh, and by packed, I mean standing room only. Um, and it was really the highlight of the entire program. So we're delighted to bring him back today. Um, Dominic is a journalist, a photographer, a playwright, and an installation artist. He's currently working on a year-long project for the National Geographic Society about the U.S.-Mexico War and the legacy of that war on American-Mexican border culture. Dominic is a recipient of a W. Eugene Smith Fellowship, multiple Pulitzer Center grants, and the 2016 Tim Hetherington Visionary Award for Innovative Media. He's a contributor, as I said, in the National Geographic magazine, the New York Times magazine, the Smithsonian, and Harper's. He's a founding member of Prime, a collective of visual artists that make work about social and environmental issues around the globe. Uh, Dominic lives in Mexico City. So please welcome and welcome back to UTA, Dominic Bracco. Hey, guys. Thank you for that, and uh, thank you all for inviting me. It's exciting to be here. Actually, I went to school at UTA, um, and I studied journalism, and I studied uh, Spanish, Spanish literature, um, and that was really, as you guys will see as my presentation moves on, that that was uh, a really important part of my foundation for the rest of my career. Um, can I move this thing off? I think so. Kind of a nervous guy. I like to move around. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I'm going to take you guys. Let's talk about the border and the border wall. Um, this is a guy who I met recently, a few weeks ago, and he, or a few months ago rather, and he was uh, he was he, he was sitting by his house, kind of cleaning up, and I I stopped by with a friend of mine. Um, to ask him what was going on. I was shooting on an assignment for Smithsonian Magazine on a story about, about the border. And um, this guy was like, hey, you know, what's going on? What are y'all doing? And, and I realized his house was actually, he had the, the fourth wall of the construction of his home was actually the border fence, okay, in, in Tijuana. And so uh, we start chatting, we're hanging out, and the whole time his mom's yelling at him, like, don't talk to them, they're journalists, and they're going to mess you up or something. And, but he was like, whatever, mom, just forget it. And uh, so we, we keep hanging out, and anyways, long story short, I'm like, look, man, like, we're, we're literally on the fence. And so I asked him, like, what? Um, do you ever go, you ever just, like, try to go across, you know? And he was like, well, of course. Yeah. So he point, he's like, points out, he's like, you see all those, those welded holes in the fence? And so I look, and there's probably about 20 or 30 of them. They're like these cutout holes in the border fence. And he's like, yeah, that, I, did, I did those. <laughs> so we've been talking a lot about building all this infrastructure and construction along the border. And uh, he's saying, you know, if they need to buy a ladder or they need to dig a hole or whatever people need to do, people, people will get around it. Um, <clears throat> I was doing some research recently, and I found this quote from Frederick Douglass. Um, for those of you that have been paying attention, he, he's been doing a lot of really good things recently. <laughs> uh, this is a quote from him in 1865. He said, when we wanted, a few years ago, a slice of Mexico, it was hinted that the Mexicans were an inferior race and that the old Castilian blood had become so weak that it would scarcely run down a hill and that Mexico needed the long, strong, beneficent arm of the Anglo-Saxon care extended over it. We said that it was necessary to its salvation and a part of the manifest destiny of this republic to extend our arm over that dilapidated government. 
Um, so I, I grew up in South Texas, and actually on my, on my father's side, they've been in South Texas since before um, it was Texas and when it was part of Mexico. <clears throat> uh, and it's been an interesting experience. I'm going to carry you guys on sort of a diary of my life as a journalist and also a little bit about myself growing up there. But it's, it's been this weird sort of existential experience where I go now on assignment to where I grew up. And so I get on an airplane because I'm also an immigrant. I live in Mexico and became a permanent resident of Mexico. I've been there for seven years now. And so for the last few years, I get on an airplane and I fly to South Texas. And I cover stories like this about migration. <clears throat> and then I go fishing with my dad and I hang out with my family. It's <clears throat> and I think like a lot of people who grew up around the border or in South Texas, um, we often have long and very complicated histories with the place. I didn't really understand this when I was growing up, but um, when I was probably middle school, I learned what a coyote was because my grandmother's brother went to prison for human trafficking. Um, my other cousins trained Contras in Central America of other family members who uh, fought in Colombia um, with, against the drug cartels. And other folks later became ICE agents. Uh, others were smugglers. Actually, on my mom's side, one of the biggest uh, drug traffickers in South Texas um, <clears throat> was smuggling for years uh, on boats from Tampico, where I later lived. And this is just like sort of the context and reality of what I was living in, but not really necessarily something that we all talked about. Um, it wasn't until later I became a journalist. Um, and I go back and hang out with my very Catholic grandmother. Here we are uh, <laughs> praying uh, at dinner. And, and it's also a place full of contradictions. So my family, my grandmother, for example, was one of the first Hispanic business owners in South Texas, and she's won and been recognized for many awards because of that. Um, but she's also extremely, extremely conservative, uh, largely because of abortion issues and things like this that have made her continue to support the Republican Party. And recently, um, she's become very anti-immigrant. <clears throat> And it's interesting because uh, I think we're coming to a point now in the United States where um, journalists are not really listened to, you know? We're being undermined constantly. Um, the press is spoken to aggressively, and, um, and when we're talked about by members of the administration, they are constantly undermining our credibility. One of the things that happens is that our Work is often used out of context. So images like this that I made of a group of migrants crossing the Rio Grande um, can often be used as propaganda by others seen as like an attack on our country. In fact, these are mostly Central American refugees. So in South Texas, there's this big thing about hunting. And it's actually tied into a lot of the legacy of the land there. You know, a lot of Hispanic families in South Texas um, moved there in the late 1700s, early 1800s, and had these huge swaths of land, and then later on lost them, mostly due to like high taxes uh, that were imposed by the state of Texas later on, or that they just simply didn't understand the language of the contracts they were signing. Um, but one of the traditions that sort of carried on has always been this idea of hunting. And we didn't have land when I was a kid. Um, and so it's always been something that my dad had this weird obsession with, taking me to go hunt. And so when I was about 25 or 26, I went hunting for the first time. <clears throat> this is my dad with his, with his rifle. And then later on, I went back as a journalist. Um, you know, around the same time, I was photographing on a ranch where uh, a lot of migrants had been found. And this is a sculpture 
on a ranch where a lot of U.S. politicians go. Um, George Bush, um, congressman, uh, there's been a long legacy of folks heading down there to sort of discuss politics but also to get away from things. And uh, this rancher there started to collect things that have been left behind. And so on the, on the left here you see um, these are backpacks left behind by migrants in South Texas. And these are wine bottles left by the country's elite and some of the most powerful men and women in the country. And then the others are, are the deer antlers. <clears throat> uh, I photographed these. Uh, these are the bodies of, of folks that hadn't, didn't make it north. And Lori is going to talk to you guys a lot more about the work that they've done. Um, but I went to cover that some years back. <clears throat> And, um, and after watching them dig up the bodies of, of these folks and, and, and do the great work that they're doing, my cousin picked me up and handed me a Miller Lite and was like, let's, let's go visit your grandparents' uh, <laughs> graves. And, uh, and so we head out about 45 minutes from, from this site and... Uh, and I took this picture of him um, next to his dad's grave. <clears throat> These are the, some Central American migrants, this is recently, this is last year, um, that had come up from Honduras and El Salvador. They're being processed by a, a Puerto Rican border patrol agent on a ranch near Harlingen. And all this stuff, you know, is, you know if I'm showing you guys like a, dirt, a diary, but what's interesting is, you know, we all, we all know this stuff is going on. I, when I was a kid, one of my earliest memories was actually getting a, ri getting a ride from my mom to school. I must have been nine or ten years old. And, uh, and I remember in front of me, there was this police officer started chasing a bunch of guys through a field, and my mom started yelling, like, for them to run, like, run, run. You know, like kind of egging them on. I mean, obviously we were in the car and they couldn't hear us, but that's what she was doing. And I was, remember being really confused because I was a kid and I thought like cops were supposed to be the good guys and there was like these guys running from the cops. And she was trying to explain to me later on about this idea of immigration. And it's something we all know happens, but it's all something that people in South Texas conveniently ignore. Um, and the government also, particularly under the Obama administration, which has deported more migrants than and undocumented folks from the United States than any other president before that, were taking large measures to keep this sort of under underreported and unseen um, from the folks that live in this community. So they would do things like move move these buses around at night, um, and these processing centers are in prisons are in pretty rural communities. And so they don't really look like much to the untrained eye, but they look like tourist buses almost. And so this is a group of migrants um, who've been arrested, being processed in Falfurias. All the while I was working there, I, um, I would go to these ranches. And this isn't to say that, um, that the ranches I was going to, that these ranches are all this way. Because I think there's also a, a, a narrative that says that all of the ranchers in South Texas are like these extreme racist, gun-toting guys, it's, which actually isn't true. In fact, there's many who are, are involved in activism. There's many who are interested in, and really care about the people that are passing through their land. Um, but this is a man that I met who has become pretty famous for creating the Texas border militiamen, um, which largely consists of folks who served in Iraq and Afghanistan who have gone to these ranches now. They're heavily armed, and they patrol around this man's land and other people's land looking for migrants. <clears throat> and I, I can understand, you know, a little bit of where this came from. You know, if you can imagine, you live out in the middle of nowhere, you have a home and you're sleeping and, and you wake up and your dogs are barking and in the middle of the night you find four or five men outside your home. Um, and this is, this is something that people see frequently and so often they're, they're scared. Um, and so the radical way to deal with this 
is to be afraid and to arm yourself. And so this militia group was formed sort of as a way to patrol land. <clears throat> and uh, at the same time, as I was a journalist covering where I was from, I was also flying to Central America and seeing the types of violence that folks were fleeing. So when I was with this guy, Vickers, I actually, it was one of my first assignments. I was on assignment for the Washington Post. I, I, had, I was actually at school at UTA, um, and this editor, Michael Dussel, called me up, and he was like, hey, you live in South Texas, right? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, do you want to go, do you want to go do an assignment for the Washington Post? And I was like, hell yeah. yeah. And so he was like, okay, they're going to build all this infrastructure down there and this big giant border wall. And, you know, it's this big initiative. And this is like in 2007 or something. And, uh, and you got you to gotta go down there and, and, and see what's going on. And so I was, I was here in Arlington, uh, and, it, and you got to be there tomorrow morning. <laughs> so, so I was like, sure, I'm, I'm really close. I can be there. So like 12 hours later, <laughs> I was in McAllen, and, uh, and I started shooting. And after a few days, I, I ran into this rancher, and he took me around, and we, we were patrolling this area uh, near the second border checkpoint. A lot of folks don't really understand this. I'm sure Laurie will go into greater detail about it. But, you know, there's a border, which is, which is the line. But the, the border region is quite large because it encompasses this other section of the United States where there's this checkpoint. And these checkpoints are along the highway, and often they're about 100 kilometers north or even, maybe even more in some places, depending on where you're at. And so what people have to do is they, cro they cross the border, and then they... They have to hike into these ranches several miles to get around the checkpoint. And this is where people end up passing away and dying. And so this, uh, this <clears throat> uh, rancher and I were driving around, and we came across the body, uh, this woman uh, who was laying face down under a mesquite tree. And she, um, at first we thought she was dead, actually. And um, we finally kind of woke her up, and she started talking to us. She, she was, in fact, alive. She was very sick and very dehydrated. Um, we gave her some water, and she just started playing with me about what she'd been through and, um, and telling me that, you know, she'd been walking for, for months and months and months and, uh, and that she'd been deported and kicked back and all this stuff. And so she'd been separated from her group, essentially, um, along this route that I'm telling you guys about, where you try to get around the checkpoint. And what often ends up happening is that the Border Patrol will go in to these ranches and chase a group. And as they chase this group, the group will, will break up. So they'll, they'll all run in different directions to try to, to, try to get away. Um, and many of these people don't necessarily understand the terrain or understand the environment there. And they're not, a lot of them are from cities. Um, they don't really know how to, to live in these types of environments. And not to mention, they, they just get lost, right? So, um, so I met this woman, and she was pleading with me sort of to help her. And I was, a young, I was a young journalist. I didn't really understand what I was doing. I was in way over my head. Um, and I remember just this, this feeling of guilt later. You know, the Border Patrol came, and I remember thinking, like, man, I just wish I could help this person. And the reality was, like, in that moment, I, I really couldn't, you know? I mean, what was I going to do? I was going to... I was going to punch this rancher who's got an AK-47 and, like, seven pistols in his truck and, like, take his car and, and run away and try to find a doctor in South Texas that's going to take this woman. And, like, that, that's ridiculous. I would never work again as a journalist. And, obviously, that, that wasn't going to happen. So I dealt with it in the best way I could. And, <clears throat> and years later, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. These are those. This is uh, Lori's team, the folks from Baylor University working in a mass grave in South Texas. Um, and, and so I, did, I dealt with it the best way I could, and that was to, to go and photograph. So I went to, to Honduras and started looking at, at that place after the Golpe de Estado, which was uh, in 2009 when they kicked out the president, Manuel Zelaya. And there was a lot of poverty um, so I met guys like these two guys, Efrain and Angel, who were, rather than 
joining these U.S. gangs that have been deported from places like Los Angeles and stuff. Um, worked in a trash dump. And um, I came across scenes of violence of like this where two, two brothers and their best friend were killed um, and left in a car in a park. And, um, or scenes like this where you had folks fighting over land rights that were being used um, for, in Bajo Juan for uh, African palm oil uh, growing. And these folks were, were fighting each other for the, the rights of their land that had been taken over by very wealthy families. And, and just all out conflict. Um, and I think that for me, uh, that was something that I didn't know, I didn't understand as a kid, you know, that all of these folks, a lot of these folks, particularly from places like Honduras and El Salvador and Guatemala that were coming through, you could say, our neighbor's land, um, were in fact refugees of violence. Uh, I also spent one of my first parts of my career, I worked significantly in, in Ciudad Juarez, a place that I've spent a lot of time. Um, which is a border town right, right across the river from El Paso. And I worked with these young guys. I actually met this kid when I was there, because I, I was a young guy. So I wanted to photograph young people and see what it was like. I didn't really understand at the time that they were so important to the narrative of the place. And I met this guy named Pollo, who was like this emo kid. And he had like, he had like pink bangs and uh, he did like this death metal <laughs> music. And, uh, <laughs> and so I, uh, I hung out with him and his friends. Actually, like, I think the next slide. This is like Pollo and his baby mama. Uh, and so I, I hang out with these guys. And, and it turns out like they're all involved in this like pretty serious gang violence and trafficking, and they're tied into all this stuff. And I did, what I learned over the course of seven years there was that these folks were all the children of factory workers, the majority of which worked manufacturing goods for the United States after NAFTA, right? So after the North American Tr Free Trade Agreement was passed, a lot of products from the United States, like corn and beef and pork, were shipped into Mexico. Um, Often, many of these goods were subsidized by the federal government, which meant that they landed in Mexico, that really hard hit areas like Michoacan, Guerrero, um, and southern states of Mexico, where they just couldn't sell their corn or their product for the same price as this big US ag. And so that started a big migration in the 90s and, and later on into the United States and also these border cities. And then these folks got jobs, and the jobs that they were working in were making $25, $35 a week. Um, to give you an example, there's a factory in, or was a factory in Webster City, Iowa, that paid its entry-level worker to make washing machines, 110 US dollars a day. And in Mexico, that same worker makes about 550 pesos a week, which is now about 30 bucks. Um, the cost of school, for your kids is about $50 a month. And if you obviously can do the math, it's quite difficult to do that. And so what ends up happening in a place that had total impunity during those years was um, kids would get together and they would start forming these, these street gangs. Um, and during that time, we also saw this massive exodus of people fleeing violence. So there's a lot, and uh, I'm just gonna tell you guys really quick about the whole project and what I'm doing. So this is a large project I'm doing, it's called the Transmedia Project. People say, well, what the hell is Transmedia? Transmedia is like Batman, so if you think about this, like Batman started as like, there's a comic book, right? And then after a comic book, there's like a movie, and there's like video games and all that stuff. So it's the same thing, but it's journalism. So basically, uh, the Northern Pass, which is about Juarez, Akiva Vimos, which is about Central America, and My Republic, is about um, Texas, and it has this multiple platforms, so I've adapted it to theater, so there's this theater production work, there's a book, and there's education, and there's virtual reality. Um, and the idea is that I took all of these, all of this work from 
places like Juarez. And remember, I, I, I went to UCA and I studied literature. So I, uh, I gathered all these conversations and I wrote a novel. And then based on that novel, we created a play at the New York Theater Workshop. Um, and so right now we're in the process of creating two more. And we used the documentary images and the photography together to project inside of this fiction narrative. So I'm going to show you guys really quick a video, and I'm done. Except this isn't working, so it's all good. Um, all right. I think that's it. <laughs> I can't get this to go, so it's all right. Um, this is really quickly the animated virtual reality section. That's about a friend of mine, Paulo Serrato, who's a, a investigator from Honduras who escaped kidnapping. And the idea is that this, um, this story, this virtual reality component would carry you through the installation. So you get to see the types of violence that folks are escaping in Central America, and that would carry you through, through the theater piece. And that theater piece would be you know, talking about what, what's happening in places like Texas. All right, that's it, since the video won't play. Oh. So, don't be silenced. The, the last, I just got back from Washington, D.C., and I spoke to a bunch of kids. Uh, Y'all, the majority of you guys are high school students, right? So I've been speaking a lot with high school students, and um, you know, it's a scary time right now. I think everybody knows somebody who's going to be affected by this um, administration negatively. And um, what's scary about it is that on the same streets, you might run across people that are openly supporting this, and that can feel really intimidating, especially probably when you're a teenager. Um, but I think you, you know. For you students, whether you're feeling like you're, you're being silenced at school, um, you know, some of the other speakers have talked about using your thumbs. And, and that's a very real thing. I mean, I think it's important to realize that we are the majority. I really think that. I really believe that. You know, having gone to Washington, D.C. and march with the women, the Women's March, and hearing people talk and seeing those protests spread across the country, things that are happening in DFW, um, at the airports. Uh, I think I think those conversations are being had, and so the way to connect to that might just be through your social media networks, which is a powerful tool. Um, but bring it up in class. You know, if your teachers can't talk about it, bring it up. And uh, and I think I think that eventually, you know, you got to realize y'all are the generation that's going to vote, and y'all quite possibly could be the generation that votes. This administration out of office, if that's what you so wish. The second question revolves around the new administration and uh, and uh, and media. How do you feel about the freeze on the EPA? Uh, how do you, as a journalist, uh, do you think you'll be affected by this? Um, we're already being affected by this pretty hard. I mean, I think uh, places like the Washington Post, for example, have tried to do things to 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 get around this. Um, and one of the ways that they've done that is through opening up these portals. So if you guys look on the website, there's, there's information portals that are secure portals that people can leak information to. Um, but that's, that's really troubling. I mean, I think we're all afraid that there's a reality that the, pre that the presidents can basically say whatever without putting any factor credibility to it, and that people will will believe it, and that's because um, you know he's built this over several years this narrative that the press is not to be trusted. People like the New York Times or folks like National Geographic or whatever are writing stories about climate change. These are not necessarily true true statements, and that climate change is not real, um, which we all know. Hopefully, that climate change is real. Um, so I feel a little worried, um, but I hope that, that folks continue to just reject those um, ideas. Okay, lastly, um, 
you do visual interpretation of immigration, why is that important? And what have you seen through your work on the U.S.-Mexico border that the general public should know but they probably don't? Yeah. Um, why is visual interpretation important? Well, how many of you guys have Instagram or Snapchat? Right. How many of you guys pick up a newspaper and read it every day? All right. So obviously visuals are very important, right? And the way that we read them is important. And um, I think it's important for us as journalists to continue to, to, to figure out how to use them better. Um, another way that you guys can get involved in that conversation is you probably all know how to use Snapchat better than I do, or most of my colleagues. Um, but there's, uh, I, I think right now there's a lot of conversations in journalism that are really important about representation and telling other people's stories. You know, I'm a person that, you know, for a long time dedicated my life to telling other people's stories, and only recently have I been bold enough to go back and talk about folks like my grandmother and, and other people. And so part of the work actually that I'm doing on the U.S. Mexico War this year is um, a long-term project about fronteriza culture. So looking at folks that live on both sides of the border and their shared and common history. And um, that's something that I think a lot of folks don't really like to think about or even know about, like that there was Tejanos and Calipareñas and Pueblo Indians and, and Spanish speakers in, in, in New Mexico that you know have a really deep, rich, shared history with Mexico. Um, and that we are part of America. 